Okay. Thank you, everybody, for coming. This is Otter Hawk talk number 12. Tonight we have Dr. Calvin Carpenter from the AKC K9 Health Foundation Foundation with us. And Becky is going to be the host tonight. So Becky, take it away. Thank you. I'm really happy that we have this opportunity to join with Dr. Carpenter tonight. And thank you so much for taking your time to be with us. I'm excited about uh, what we can um, learn from you and how we can support the Canine Health Foundation uh, further. Uh, I think for some folks, um, are, there are quite a few people that are not all that familiar with what your mission is and what happens there. So uh, it's great that you'll be able to provide us that information. And it's also really nice that Robin can put this on our, um, we have a YouTube channel where we can make this available to our members who are unable to come tonight. And surprisingly enough, there's a lot of folks that have classes, dog classes and things like that going on right now. So uh, they were not able to come. Uh, but for all of you, I would like to introduce to you Dr. Carpenter. He's the executive director of the Canine Health Foundation. And in this role, he, is direct, he has direct oversight of all the Canine Health Foundation programs, finances, uh, and development and provides leadership and strategic direct direction uh, toward achievement of Canine Health Foundation's mission and goals. Um, Dr. Carpenter earned his veterinary degree at Oklahoma State University and his MBA at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Uh, he of the American College of Laboratory Animal Medicine. Dr. Carpenter lives in Cary, North Carolina with his wife, Heather, and his lab mix, Trip. He enjoys outdoors, which a lot of us also enjoy, traveling and cooking. So uh, welcome to the Otterhound Club of America, Dr. Carpenter, and we'll let you take over. Well, thank you, Becky. I appreciate that, and I appreciate the opportunity of coming and speaking. I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen and I've put together a, a presentation uh, to, to tell you a little bit more about the foundation and, and what we do. Let me get to... Okay, can everybody see that okay? Perfect. Perfect. So again, thank you for the opportunity to come in and speak with you all today. Uh, tell you a little bit about who we are. One, we're, uh, of course, that you've already heard the AKC Canine Health Foundation. We're an independent affiliate of the AKC. We're a 501c3 nonprofit foundation focused entirely on dogs. That's all, all we, we're concerned about we're, uh, is canine health. And we've been doing that for 25 years now. Uh, this is a kind of a picture of our team. We have, of course, being a 501c3, we have a board of directors that provides us overall guidance. I'm the executive director and we are split into uh, development, finance and programs and operations. And those are our kind of major areas that we focus on. This is our mission statement. It's a little bit long. But, but it's really about dedicated to advancing the health of all dogs and, the, and to a certain aspect their owners, because we'll talk about one health later on. Uh, but we do that through scientific research and supporting dissemination of health information to prevent, treat and cure canine diseases. So our vision is really across uh, a, a lot of different health areas of dogs across their entire lifetime. And, and as we mentioned, we we look at the One Health model and we'll talk a little bit about that later on. Our goals, we have three primary goals. The first one is to fund uh, canine health research projects. And the second one is really about monitoring and, and you know, it's one thing to fund it, the health research, but then trying to actually monitor and make sure that you're actually getting the results that you want. And then finally, once you get those results, it's about communicating to the, the owners, veterinarians, researchers, the clubs about the funded discoveries uh, so that they can 
potentially take action based on those. And we kind of look at that from the constituents. We feel like we, you know, everybody that I have dealt with uh, as far as coming here uh, loves their animals. You know, every everybody. So everybody is looking at canine health and canine health just means so much everybody, whether it's the club, the individual, uh, we have the support of found different foundations and we also have corporate, uh, a number of corporate support. But I will have to say that our, our major supporters are really the individuals in the club. And, and you feel like that's the case because of the passion and everything they have for their breeds and, and the health associated with their breeds. And, and so when we partner with the clubs, we, we, we feel like it has to deal with communication and collaboration. Um, we don't necessarily know all the diseases or all the conditions or all the concerns that you might have with the, associated with your breed. And so we have to be able to communicate with you as well as you communicate with us as far as what you consider are the most important thing related to your breed. Um, and then we have to figure out, well, who, who actually can do the research? You know, you have to locate the researchers to actually do it. So if, if you have a concern about epilepsy or cancer or whatever, then we have to be able to figure out, well, who, who actually can do that particular work? And, and believe it or not, it's not that easy. Uh, I think when it comes to, let's say, human health research, a lot of people are doing that. They're funded, well-funded, whatever. With canine research, it, it's not uh, as strong as with the human research. Uh, and for us, we, we do that through soliciting scientific research proposals. And we'll talk a little bit about that, that process also. But this final point, I think, is, is really important because, you know, a lot of clubs are not that big. You know, you don't have unlimited resources. You don't, you don't have unlimited me membership. You don't have all these things to support some real large study. And so one of the benefits I think that we can uh, uh, provide is the fact that we can bring a collaborative and a community effort into those research things. So bringing different clubs together or individuals get together to fund a larger project is it, it, it expands how much impact that the, potentially that project can do. And it, it expands how much impact that your funds or your dollars can make toward, toward that particular disease. Now, I will say since our inception in 1995, uh, we've supported over a thousand uh, awarded grants, which comes out to about almost $60 million worth of canine health research grants. We've also supported what I like is um, residencies and fellowships because really that that provides you with the next generation of whether it's ethereal genologists or next generation of researchers, uh, you know, you're potentially supporting that. Uh, and of course we all, I think the end goal is we want healthier, happier dogs, whether it's this generation or the next generation, that is really, really what we'd like to see. So we fund research in 23 different research program areas. And, and really, we talk about for the health of all dogs. Uh, currently, we have about 154 active grants uh, with a funding total of about 10.6 million. And I know you can't read all of this, uh, but I will tell you that oncology, uh, of which we have four primary research program areas, comprise about 30% of the active portfolio. Uh, cardiology and uh, neurology, ep epilepsy are kind of the other big uh, program areas that we're supporting. We have also focused on different initiatives uh, throughout the, the years, tick-borne diseases, emerging infectious diseases, epilepsy, hemangiosarcoma, canine cancer, and One, one Health. Now, I have to kind of like ha give a little explanation on One Health, because, you know, for a lot of people, it's not, it's a new thing to hear, you know, what, what exactly is One Health? What do you, you mean? And, and really, it's something that's recently came about, and it's recognizing the interconnection between people, animal, plants, and their shared environment, uh, especially when it comes to us and our dogs. 
uh, let's say there's a, a toxin in the environment, there's an infectious disease in the environment, you know, our dogs are potentially susceptible to it as well as we're susceptible to it. So there's that interaction that we have to realize between the environment and, and, and us and our animals. That's a little bit different than sometimes you'll hear about uh, translational uh, medicine or comparative medicine. And, and that's really talking about looking at the similarities between the dog and the human and whether uh, treatments developed in the dog can work in the human, vice versa, can treatments in the, the human potentially work in the dog. Uh, so, so that's a, a little bit different. So in 2020, we did award uh, 53 new grants and they total probably about $3.3 million. Now I will say 24% of those or 13 grants were genetic in nature, looking at potential genetic of, of disease. Uh, 36 actually had a, a one health component, which translates between uh, potentially had a, an impact on the dog as well as the human. And I will say 84% were not breed specific. And the reason I wanted to highlight that is, you know, we do have certain proposals and, and grants that are focused on a specific breed, but the vast majority of, of uh, grants that we're supporting have applicability across multiple different groups. Now we fund, I know there was a question about our process and how we fund things and those kind of things. And so we'll try to address that a little bit. Um, we, we tend to lump grants into small and large, we call them acorns and oaks. Acorns are less than $15,000. Um, those are usually looking at preliminary data or they're small kind of, of question. We also look at oaks, which are larger, uh, over $15,000, sometimes over $100,000. And those research grants are solicited through requests for proposals. And we put out a number of requests for proposals throughout the year. Um, we also have what we call memorandums of understanding. Uh, those are typically those um, research proposals where a club or a group of clubs are looking at a specific question and they're trying to address a specific question, sometimes with a specific researcher out there. And, and so uh, we have, you'll, you'll see in our list and I'll point those out, a number of, of those. So when it comes to the grant selection or process, um, we put out a request for proposals and those are typically based on our program areas. Um, we screen all proposals for what we call our um, humane treatment of, of animal policy, because we're, we're fairly strict as far as we're only funding projects that involve client owned animals. We're not funding uh, research or laboratory animals. It's all about supporting the client owned animals. Uh, so we wanna screen those first. Then we go through a scientific review process and that's usually an external review and then uh, a review panel that meets. And we look at things like impact, um, significance, innovation, research methods, personnel and environment. And we kind of rate them, all those different particular items. And then uh, based on that, um, you know, obviously we wanna ensure that a, a proposal has scientific merit and potential impact for canine health before it's, it's recommended for approval. And those recommendations for approval uh, will go either to the scientific review committee if they're small or up to our executive committee uh, if they're larger ones. So, so they make the final determination on, on what, what gets funded. Uh, and then once they get funded, uh, of course, we, we have to reach an agreement with the institution. It's not, it's not the PI, it's we have to uh, form an agreement with the, the institution. And then after we have that signed agreement in the research starts, uh, we maintain uh, progress reports every six months. So that, that gives us a view as far as, well, are they meeting their goals? Uh, are they accountable for their funding? You know, And then we can provide those progress reports to the sponsors. Um, and, it, and as well as 
it allows us to know, let's say if they need study participation, we can help them with the study participation, reaching out to the clubs or reaching out through our, 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 our Facebook, social media, other things to try to bring in participation into the studies. Because it, I'm sure you can imagine like during, especially this time period, trying to get uh, participation enrollment into a study, it's, it's way more difficult right now. Uh, but through that, we try to keep our costs down through low overhead and administrative costs. Uh, and so this is my, my COVID disclaimer category. So um, around the March, April timeframe, as you can imagine, uh, there was a lot of study delays that we saw. Uh, veterinary schools were closing due to non-essential uh, research. Uh, we saw restrictions on personnel facilities, and of course, that impacted study enrollment. Um, but probably the July, maybe the August time frame, we started them started seeing the vet schools and the academic institutions opening up, and they might have restrictions, but it allowed the work to start and continue, and of course, uh, actually allowed enrollment and participation in studies, which have started to kind of normalize. And so, a lot of the things that might have been off track back in July are now getting back on track at this time period. So, which is which is good to see. So I wanted to go a little bit through our, our portfolio. So this is just a, a picture of our 2021 a research grants portfolio, which includes everything that is currently open, not just the newest grants, but everything that's open. And of course that's available on our website. You had mentioned uh, certain topics that were primarily concerned, so I thought I'd, I'd throw out epilepsy first, and then we do some of the, the cancer topics. Obviously, we have ongoing projects in all, um, all 23 of our specific areas. So these are some of the ones that are currently um, have been started uh, for epilepsy, and you see the the different institutions that they're doing, uh, the different uh, project titles. And in our uh, portfolio, it also talk a little bit about the particular projects, give the abstracts. Uh, right now, we have additional epilepsy proposals under review, and we, we have a review panel that's meeting this month for additional proposals. Uh, uh, and I think one of the questions previously also was about researchers that are currently doing uh, epilepsy, looking at genetics and epilepsy. And in the past, um, we've seen, we have funded support at places like the University of Missouri, University of Minnesota, and the UC Davis, uh, and that have done a lot of genetic work for us. Um, I think we mentioned before, genetics is a, is a large component of our program. And, and we definitely have funded a large number of projects with that. Uh, hemangiosarcoma. Um, this is this is one of those those areas that um, a, a lot of different breeds are concerned about. So a lot of different interests and and a lot of different work. We have quite a bit of work that's ongoing in it right now. Um, you can see the one where I mentioned about the memorandum of understanding, and there's been a, a long study at the University of Minnesota funded by about uh, three or four different uh, breed groups uh, looking at hemangiosarcoma and looking over a, a long period of time. And, and that's, I think, probably one of the frustrating things sometimes about research is it doesn't necessarily, you don't get that answer just right away. Sometimes it takes, it's an iterative, slow process that over time you try to get the, uh, you try to get the answers for, but it, it sometimes it just doesn't happen right away. And you can also see that it's a mixture of those smaller grants, those acorns, as well as the, the larger grant, the oak kind of thing. And it's also um, with hemangiosarcoma, there's just so much that we don't know about this particular disease. Uh, and I think one of the big things that we don't know is, you know, uh, is about how to identify it early on and trying to understand that because most of the time when 
individuals find out that their dog has hemangiosarcoma, it has progressed uh, fairly uh, long and, and is pretty much at that point where, you know, the, you know, you've maybe you have splenic hemangiosarcoma, uh, the spleen's ruptured, and then now you're in a, in a surgical situation where uh, the animal has just maybe a short period of time to live. And trying to identify it early, I think, is, a, is an extremely important thing. Lymphoma, we have a lot going on with lymphoma. Um, and lymphoma, I think, is one of those diseases, too, that there's a lot going on on the human side as well as the, the animal side. And, and being able to understand and, and utilize potentially what's being developed on the human side for the animal is, is kind of one of those important translational areas. Uh, compared to, let's say, hemangiosarcoma, the comparative disease in humans is angiosarcoma, which is fairly rare, whereas we know that lymphoma is not, uh, not something that's rare in humans. So we, we do see a lot of activity on lymphoma. Uh, we also have some activity on osteosarcoma. And for all of these uh, uh, different cancers, we will, I think we'll have another slide later on, we are in the review process where we'll be funding additional projects in these, these particular areas. And then our fourth area in, in oncology or cancer is really, it's kind of a general oncology. And so it, it has a lot of different things. It has, you know, uh, we'll fund projects like melanoma, sarcoma, uh, histiosarcoma, men, uh, meningioma, leukemia. You see, there's a lot of different, uh, this is different types of cancers that are funded in this one. So this is kind of a, a more catch-all. It, it involves multiple different breeds and um, multiple different cancers. And so one of the things that we always are kind of struggle with and, and work on is, you know, how do you measure the outcomes related to the work that you're doing? Uh, because you do have a lot of investment in, in education research and research. Some of the ways that we try to do it is through the number of peer review publications. And we probably have about over 800 peer review publications, uh, citations that are associated with those publications. And then you can see that we have quite a large number of publications that come out with a, a genetic component. Uh, we've also supported um, more than 40 Therio genealogy residents as well as clinician scientist fellowships. So, um, so those are kind of some of the outcomes that we look at. And these are some of the recent ones that we just supported. The, uh, in 2021, we've actually going to have a resident uh, at uh, Virginia, Maryland, as well as the University of Florida. And then we have three clinician uh, scientist fellowships that will be starting in 2021. And of course, this is something we try to do every single year. Uh, support the, these individuals. And, and the therogenology, I have to uh, say that it's in collaboration with both the AKC as well as the Therogenology uh, Foundation. And the clinician scientist is something that's supported both by individuals and clubs with their, their sponsorship. So on the educational side, uh, one of the, some of the things that we did in 2020 were things like vet buying webinar series, uh, had a number of different webinars that we that we put on, uh, just uh, promoting dissemination of information, as well as uh, help with uh, continuing education. And I know that, uh, of course, 2020 has been pretty much all virtual for a lot of people. And so this kind of helps with that. Um, we do a number of things with a, a series on infectious diseases. Uh, we tried to do a little bit more outreach on, with the veterinary clinics, uh, launching a newsletter to veterinary practitioners. And we feel like that's kind of important. It's, it's one thing developing the information, but then you have to get it out there to the, the veterinarians that are actually out in practice so that they can potentially utilize that particular information. Um, and, you know, and that's the same with the continuing education. It, it allows those veterinarians that are in practice to get the latest type of information. Uh, we've also looked at 
uh, conference sponsorships and and here in North Carolina, we kind of sponsored several lectures and uh, supported their annual meeting. Um, and and as part of trying to get things out, uh, we have you know done a new per public service announcement that's on our platform as well as AKC TV. Uh, we supported the genetics white paper that was uh, presented by Dr. Oberbauer at the September uh, Delegates Health Committee meeting, as well as there was an update in January. Uh, so we've, we've trying to not only support the development of, of additional resources, um, like not only that one, but let's say like breeder training and seminars, those types of things. Uh, and then there's a lot of times special topics like let's say the golden retriever pigmentary ubiitis, those special topics that we'll try to develop support webinars and, and dissemination of information on. So what are we gonna do in, in kind of 2020, 2021? What are we looking at starting to do? So there's several pending areas that are under review. Uh, and under, I say negotiation, because projects have already been selected for funding. It's just that we're, we're in the process of negotiating with the institution. And those are projects in the uh, endocrinology, gastrointestinal disease, and musculoskeletal disease that were reviewed last uh, quarter. Uh, we had cancer proposals that were reviewed in December that we're now looking at, at funding in the first of the year. And then, of course, we mentioned the epilepsy. Uh, review panel that's meeting actually this month. Um, and then upcoming areas, uh, we have currently two open RFPs in the areas of ophthalmology and cardiology. Uh, and then we're looking at later on this year, tick-borne diseases, cancer, um, select canine topic areas, which is really uh, looking at those research program areas that need additional projects, as well as FLSC again. Um, you know, we can, based on the interest that's in the different program areas, and we try to gauge the interest in the different program area, we try to continue to support those, those areas as much as possible. Um, and then starting out the year, we have five webinars uh, planned in uh, 2021, uh, and we always look for different ways to kind of expand that and do different things. Uh, we're going, we want to continue veterinary outreach and see how we can expand veterinary outreach as much as possible. Uh, again, as well as increasing the communication, whether it's through um, the different social medias or other type of media. And then this year, every two years, we have the National Parent Club uh, Canine Health Conference. And so this year is the year for that. And, 2021, uh, which will be August 13th through the 15th in St. Louis. However, as probably everybody that does planning this time period, uh, you have to have the, okay, we'll, we, we'd like to do it on site, but we have the realization that it may have to go virtual. So you kind of do that planning kind of in parallel. And then we always have to end with how can you help? And of course, you know, donate to research. Uh, and there's multiple different ways individuals can donate to research, whether it's through your donor advice fund, program areas, endowment, or unrestricted, which is the area of greatest need. Or as a group, of course, the donor advice fund. Um, but it doesn't look like the your your club utilizes that that much, which it that's not uncommon. Uh, or sponsoring a program area or a specific grant. grant. Uh, and then obviously the last thing is participate in funded research. You know, we encourage if let's say there's an epilepsy um, research project that your animal can potentially participate in that, that you consider that. So that was a lot, I, I admit it. Um, so I'd like to stop and take a, a breath or two and then uh, open it up for questions. All righty, we have uh, one question. 
Uh, there was a litter born of nine puppies and four were diagnosed with hemangiosarcoma. Does Dr. Carpenter have any recommendations on how to find if DNA would be useful to any current studies? Um, I would say the DNA, yes, the DNA would be useful. The DNA would, would definitely be useful. Uh, a lot of times we, um, we recommend DNA going into the, I don't know, do you all have a data bank at the OFA right now? The Orthopedics Foundation for, for Animals? Uh, Dr. That's- Dr. Carpenter, um, we have all been uh, sending our blood in from our puppies for since about 2003. So we have almost all of the hounds born in the US are at, um, are with the OFA data, uh, DNA bank. What wonderful, wonderful. Because you know the thing. Sometimes you're you're worried that if it goes to a particular in, investigator, it stays with the investigator versus going to someplace like a OFA that can potentially be utilized by multiple multiple different investigators. Um, you know the hemangiosarcoma, especially in your your the scenario that I'm hearing here. You, you have to think that there is a genetic component and they have not fully elucidated that genetic component yet. And so trying to understand that and, and, and I will have to say that with genetics, um, we continually see um, the tools getting stronger, faster, more comprehensive and, and the data generated that is just a lot of data and, and it's it takes these really smart people out there to try to sort through all that data. So um, I, I've, I am hopeful that over time that that is something that's going to be identified. I really am. Dr. Carpenter, the question was actually more along the lines of how do we find um, who to who to contact with that information? You know, the I I didn't see any studies on on genetic components of hemangio out there. So how do we find out how, who, who's going to find that information useful? I mean, that's a, that, that is an excellent question. That is an excellent question. I mean, we have funded genetic studies in the past for hemangiosarcoma that have not been that fruitful. Uh, so we're, we're just not there yet. But we do um, know the investigators, particularly that do the genetic type of work that could potentially start readdressing that question. Uh, and, and we've, if, if we go back, what I typically do is go back through my, the research proposal. And sometimes it's those proposals that have already been closed and try to look at those investigators that have previously done the, the genetic research in the past and try to identify them to see whether those would be uh, people that could potentially support it in the future. Well, thank you. Uh, we have another question that popped up. Uh, how does a club become a sponsor for a research study? You can work with us. We typically, we have a dollar amount on it, but it's a fairly low dollar amount. Uh, most of the, uh, and that's like $2,000. So if you fund it at 2000 or more, then you technically become a sponsor and you're identified on the, the website uh, for that particular project as being a sponsor to it. And then we'll, we provide um, regular updates to all sponsors on that. So what we usually see happening is, is clubs will look at the projects and see if they're of interest to them and, um, and then contact us and say, we would like to sponsor this particular pro project. Um, and we should be getting, um, your health liaison should be getting regular updates, I think on the particular project. I don't, I'm not sure who your health liaison is though. Oh, you. So what, what information are you getting from us and is, is it adequate? Uh, I usually get the quarterly newsletters. Um, we did sponsor, we, we, uh, I think we sponsored too. I was trying to look it up in my computer files. 
um, two different projects last year, one for $2,000 and one for $2,500. Um, I think one was epilepsy and one was um, either hemangio or lymphoma, I don't remember. Um, but we, uh, we, have, we have been involved. We've also sponsored previous projects for epilepsy as well. Yeah, and we'll have, um, so what we can do, uh, you, you saw, it's kind of a limited number right now. I think it was like four or something that we have currently, but um, like I said, we're, we're going to, we're actually, I believe it's tomorrow that we're actually going through a review panel on epilepsy proposals uh, that we'll, we'll go through. And once we determine that, we can provide you with those particular projects to see if those are of interest. Nice. Awesome. Um, the next one says, how are, does the CHF allow for pooling of club funds to fall under their foundation? Pooling of club funds to fall. Um, for supporting projects, we allow multiple different clubs to, to let's say, get together and, and support a per particular project. Right now, um, Right now, most of the clubs, what they have is the, what we call the donor advised fund. So those funds are, are with us. Uh, usually those have come about mainly because of the Perina Parent Club Program, where funds have come in through that type of arrangement. Uh, but yeah, we do allow multiple clubs to kind of pool funds in support of, of a particular project. Fantastic. Um, let's see, how do clubs encourage donations from members? Are there best practices that you might recommend? You know, it, it, it's, it's, it's funny that you say that. I say it's funny loosely, but um, that is a, is a common, common question, even from some of the, the larger clubs. And, and we've actually had conversations with, let's say, the Golden Retrievers and, and some of the, the bigger clubs. and, and everybody is always kind of like, well, how, what is the best way to do it? And, and I think most of what they're doing is that, that constant communication and, and, and providing information to their membership. Um, uh, the most successful ones that I've seen though, are kind of the more of the grassroots ones that are constantly in contact with their, their membership. Awesome. Uh, let's see. Uh, is there any research underway to determine the mode of inheritance for epilepsy? We've we have supported research for that in, in the past, um, and and I would I would have to say yes. The, the the researchers that I mentioned, like at Missouri and Minnesota and UC Davis, uh, as well as uh, I think we had one other one, um, have looked at the mode of epilepsy mode of inheritance for epilepsy. Uh, and, you know, now what we're seeing, you know, early on, I think a lot of these inherited diseases, uh, they, they might have had one gene or two genes or sometimes three genes associated with it. And, and, and those were kind of the, the easier ones. Uh, now we're seeing where there might be multiple genes and maybe some environmental and uh, other factors associated with causing the disease. So it, it's, it is a lot harder. Uh, but again, the, the most of the genetic research that we've supported has been at like Missouri, Minnesota, UC Davis. Um, I think it's a, like the Broad Institute, Harvard, those, those areas is where we've seen most of our genetic research. Nice. Fantastic. You know, as uh... With a background of genetics myself, this is very near and dear to my heart. So thank you for answering these. Um, let's, uh, let's see. Is well, you, there... you should have been answering them. <laughs> Maybe one day. <laughs> well, I mean, isn't it isn't it kind of true though? With the, um, I mean, there's a lot of genetic information going out there right now. Mm -hmm. I know with all the people doing genetic tests and, and those type of things, you you you're, you potentially are going to get inundated with all this genetic information. Oh, absolutely. Uh, so, and so it, it definitely becomes 
uh, it becomes a chore to try to get all that information that you're you're now getting. Mm -hmm. It's almost like a game of Sudoku, or it's you know which which number fits where. But uh, oh, we have another question: uh, Is there any research underway to determine? Oh, sorry, I just read that one. Second question: um, Is there any way we can get a readout on that research? Um, so a, a lot of the research that we get is, is still in the confidential, confidential category until it gets published. And because, you know, these, these are things that typically the information is held by the researcher, and then they want to make sure that it goes through peer review and everything else and gets published before, um, before it gets released to the public. Uh, the one thing that we do do with the, um, the sponsors of a particular project is provide them with a lay summary. And that lay summary is provided by the investigator that gives a, a kind of a status of where it's at and the results and everything else that we, you know, we can provide to the, the sponsors of the project. Perfect. Um... That's all the questions I have over on my end. Robin, did you have any additionals pop over to you? I do not have any, but if anybody else has any questions, feel free to either um, unmute and ask directly or use the chat function on the bottom of your screen. Anybody? Joey, do you have any final comments? Oh, there's a question. Um, from Deb Follett, since epilepsy is one of the reasons that we rule out dogs for our rare breeding program, it would be helpful to be more engaged. I think that was just a response maybe to the uh, research readout question. Is that right, Deb? Feel free to unmute if you need to. Deb, you wanna ask that question? Okay, I didn't know how to unmute. Thank you, kind of new to Zoom here. Uh, yeah, thank you for the information. And one, one of the challenges is to be able to pull all this data together. So I didn't know if you were aware, but we actually rule out dogs from our breeding program um, if there is any epilepsy in their uh, direct um, sibling population. And given our small numbers to start with, this is quite devastating on our breeding. And so that's why I, I'm so, in, you know, so interested in this. My daughter is studying to be a theogenologist um, due to this uh, and her love for the breed. And so I'm just trying to understand how we might be able to get more information, better engaged since it has such an effect on our particular breed. Well, and you know, that's, one of the things about giving up, getting the information, you know, because you, you want really, especially with breeding, you want to make an informed decision. Uh, you, do, you don't want to throw out every single dog just because you think that, well, this dog might have this, this condition. No, by knowing the genetics, and that's why it's so important finding out the, the genetic, then you can make an informed decision on how best to potentially mitigate the disease without just you know, uh, getting rid of genetic diversity, getting rid of animals, uh, those type of things. And, and that's, I, I think, you know, that's the key component is finding out exactly what is the, the genetic com component. So Dr. Carpenter, would you recommend that we contact the three uh, programs that are studying the genetics of uh, Missouri, Minnesota, and UC Davis to see if they would have any particular advice for our particular breed, or what would you recommend we do to try to find some answers? Well, uh, obviously the, the researchers out there are going to help pull together the, the information. There's, there's, not a lot that we can do with, without their, their kind of support on that. Um, and then getting with them and trying to, trying to find out who is kind of available that can do it. You know, and I mentioned early on that sometimes the, the researchers, we have a limited pool that we deal with. And sometimes 
you know, they have constraints on their time and everything else like that. And getting them engaged is sometimes a, a, an important part of, of the particular project process. And, and I know that, you know, your club is not alone in the fact that reaching out to investigators and seeing if, if they can somehow come up with an answer um, is, is, is a, I would have to say fairly common. Um, you know, because everybody cares about their animals. Everybody loves their animals and wants to, to do the best for them. Just um, so, so everybody here knows, we've had an intimate relationship with Dr. Johnson at University of Missouri and Dr. Patterson at University of Minnesota, both of which are, are I'm sure, Dr. Con on Dr. Carpenter's list of people that study epilepsy. And all of our blood that goes to the OFA DNA bank is, is stored at um, at University of Missouri in Dr. Johnson's lab, and they keep track and know who's there. So um, it's not that we have, it's not that we're not, the club isn't doing anything. It's not that the Otterhound breeders and owners aren't doing anything at this point. Um, it's just sometimes very slow going, and especially with Dr. Johnson, I think you have to stay on top of things and, and give him a kick every now and then to try to uh, to get him back involved in our stuff because he gets pulled off onto so many different tangents very easily. And, and you just mentioned the two people that I was thinking of and with Dr. Oberbauer, who's at UC Davis yeah. and, and yeah. they are highly, highly engaged, very good. I mean, uh, I, I love I love their work. I mean, they do yeah. some excellent, excellent work. Yes, they probably get pulled in a lot of different directions. Yeah. Dr. Oberbauer, Dr. Bell at um, Dr. Gerald Bell and Dr. Patterson have all given us their recommendation on what we do about breeding dogs with epilepsy, siblings of dogs with epilepsy. And they have all agreed that we should not be throwing out siblings. We should be only throwing them out if more than 20% of the litter has seizures. They're very big proponents about conserving the breed and trying to find out a way to conserve the breed because just getting rid of all the animals is not the, not the answer. Thank you very much for digging into that. That was really helpful. Does anybody else have any questions, comments, concerns? All righty. Okay. All right. I guess hearing well, thank none. you. Yes, we really appreciate your taking the time to meet with us and help us uh, understand more about what the AKC Canine Health Foundation does and know what a rich resource it is for all of us. And uh, I hope I'm looking forward to the fact that there will be more folks that will be able to watch this later on uh, because they weren't able to be here tonight. And we, we just thank you, thank you, thank you for um, joining us this evening. And thanks to all the participants who also came on uh, tonight and so uh, I guess at this point, we'll say good evening. Thank you very much, Dr. Carpenter. We certainly appreciate it. And just a reminder, we'll put this uh, uh, Zoom recording onto YouTube on the Outer Home Club of America channel. And I'll also send you all a uh, email with the link to that so you can have it um, handy. And uh, thank you very much. Thanks for everybody for coming. Our next Outer Talk is on Sunday, February 21st with uh, Bev, it's going to be um, grooming and care and maintenance for your Otter Hound. So join us for that next one and stay tuned for more. Good to see all of you and thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you all. Good night. Good night.